How do you do? You may be seated. This certainly is a privilege to be back again tonight in Beaumont, Texas. Ever since I was here the first time, I've always longed to get back again to minister and uh, fellowship around the Word of God with you dear people again. Never left my heart. I can remember many great things that happened the last time I was here in Beaumont. So I preached it about 12 years ago. About, I remember there was a people we just had a great meeting over at Houston. Now, I, or did I go from here to Houston? Here from Houston here. And that's where the angel of the Lord came down and took the picture of it. And I think we got about six or eight pictures of that since then, you know, different places. Three in Germany just recently. We got one in color, crotochrome color up at um, somewhere in the fairgrounds in California, Lakeport, California, where the Christian businessman had so really a beautiful picture of his presence, that amber fire burning around. This one, of course, is taken with a black and white, and it uh, just shows it as white, but it really is an amber light. And as I always said, since like one of the little lads here, it was a, I said a greenish yellow. <laughs> I didn't know what Amber was, so I said a greenish yellow. And when I heard the other day the boys was, was praying and about which way to go when we started out the first year, and the first place fell on my heart was Beaumont, Texas. I said, have you got any contacts? He said, several. I said, start calling them, and we'll start from there and you'll see where the Lord will lead us. And this is our first meeting after the, the first of the year. A while ago, I was told by my son, when we came down with Brother Jack uh, Moore's daughter from the hotel, or motel rather, they were talking, and I believe Billy told me that the brother, the pastor of this church, I've never met him unless I see my second with right here, that have been praying for years to come back to Beaumont. That's right. Or, uh, I'll never know how to appreciate loyal friends like that till we cross the river somewhere. Yeah. A man that believes that much in a ministry that the Lord Jesus gave me. No wonder I couldn't think of anything else but Beaumont this time. Prayer changes things. And I heard that there was another brother that joined with him in prayer. It's gone on to glory. That's right. Billy was telling me about it a few moments ago as Jack and I, and he come down from the hotel. Well, no doubt, tonight in a better land and what this is, you must know about it. Uh, I believe that, that when a man dies, he just, death means separation. He only separates from our sin, but he's always alive. He, he hears my words and believeth on him that sent me as everlasting life. And shall never come into condemnation, but pass from death unto life. Oh, I, I believe that. Hallelujah. We can't die. I've got eternal life. Eternal, anything's eternal, never had a beginning or an end. So, as God's own life, uh, eternal life comes from the Greek word there, Zoe, which means God's own life is in us. And when we become sons and daughters of God, then we live just as God lives. Can no more die than he can die. So we're part of him. Aren't you glad to be sons and daughters of God? What a wonderful thing. You know, I think some of the best meetings we ever had is in churches. Now, I like sometimes the meetings, you know, get to a place where we, uh, crowds are great, we can't get into the, uh, to little churches and so forth, or the big churches, but there's something about a church house, now, I hope you won't think that I've went off on some tantrum since I've seen you last, but... You know, I believe that a place, a church, is where God stays. Amen. Angels dwell among the churches. It's a place that's dedicated to service of God. Right. Out in these uh, auditoriums and things, we find they have parties, dances, drinking, and everything. And you feel the, the spirit that don't seem right. It just seems like it's a... And otherwise, the Holy Spirit always seems to work so much different when you're in a church, you know, somewhere especially in a good spirit-filled church where the people are filled with the Holy Spirit and great signs and wonders take place and people who believe these things to be true. The people are the church. The church is the word being called out. It's a body of people that's called out of the world 
to walk with God. That is the church. I'm so glad to be one of those tonight. If I had a hundred lives to live and there was no hereafter after I died, I'd still want to live every one of them for Jesus Christ. Uh, it means that to me. Brother Jack was showing me uh, the advertisement I stopped with his church last night coming down a very fine spiritual church at Shreveport, Louisiana. And he was uh, showing me a picture that he put in the paper when I was there several years ago. Quite a change. First would know it was the same person. <laughs> but it's somehow or another in this human body that we get old and rot, that's all. But our spirits remain the same. We cannot die. I said last night at Brother Jack's church, I said, if we could understand, this is my hand, this is my finger, this is my ear, this is my nose, this is my eyes, but who is me? Who is me that owns this? This is not me, this is something that I own. See, your spirit. You never did see me. You see what's mine that declares me, but you never seen me. Like the Bible said, no man has seen God at any time, but the only God and the Father has declared him. God was in Christ, reconciled the world to himself. They seen what God was because he expressed himself through Christ because he had the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He could express him. But now, and then as we are sons and daughters of God and joint heirs with him in the kingdom, then we express him in our lives. Sometimes, if, if m many of us would just live our sermons instead of preaching, I think it would be better if we just go ahead and live the sermon. You know, it's a lot better to live me one than it is preach me one, I believe, because I can, I, I can see your life. God looks at our lives, and the world looks at our lives. He wants to know what our lives are, and people know us, no matter our, our action is so loud, it drowns our testimony. Depends on what we say. If we are Christians and don't live it, then the people know better. But when we are Christians and say we're Christians and live like Christians, our lives will do it if we never say nothing else. Our lives, we're written epistles, read of all men. So they watch how you walk. Now, I was saying the other day about being sealed by the Holy Spirit. A seal is marked on both sides. They see you coming, they see you going. <laughs> look like a Christian coming, you look like a Christian going. <laughs> when you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. So tonight, uh, I have a speaker with me, Brother Jack Moore. I'm sure all of you know him, and, and I come down to kind of pray for some of the sick folks, and Brother Jack is going to do the preaching for me. So I'm sure you enjoyed his message. He, um, he's a good speaker, and, and I, I'm not a preacher, so I just kind of uh, always said I was a spare car. <laughs> and the spare car, you use it when you got a flat. Now, we haven't got any flats. You can see that tonight. But... Somehow or another, we roll a little on the spare tire, maybe if the Lord will permit it. Now, I think they got another place they're going to tomorrow night. I'll say that for the folks outside, which I believe there will be seating room. Is that right, Brother Pastor? Yes, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to come to the answer of this brother's prayer. I am. God bless this church. Bless this brother. All these congregations, a fine bunch of cooperating pastors. Someone told me, I forget how many churches was coming in to cooperate, to have a meeting. I certainly appreciate that, brethren. We are, we are not divided. All one body we. Amen. That was so proved that at Houston, when the angel of the Lord had his picture taken for the first time there, when there's something in common, a divine healing was at stake, what we all believed. Then our little differences was forgotten. Everybody just pulled right in and got the other. I think when Solomon built the first temple, it was cut out from all over the world. Chipped in, cut out from the quarries, and the, and the cedars cut up at Lebanon, and floated down to Joppa, and hauled in by ox cart, and so forth. And it was so massively built that when the temple went together, it had all kind of little funny-looking stones in it. But when they begin to read the blueprint, it was all in the blueprint. That's right. And there wasn't not even a buzz of a saw or sound of a hammer for 40 years in building the temple. Amen. I think that's the way God's got his people all cut out. One's got a nature of one kind, one another, but they're all Christians, fitted stones, jointed together upon the chief cornerstone, Christ Jesus. Oh, that is the main thing. So many reject that precious cornerstone. Where well, we're all built together, cemented together with God's love. That's right. God's love. 
And when we have that, there's nothing will separate us. There's nothing can divide us as long as we love one another. I've been a minister for 31 years. I've seen all kinds of gifts. I've, I've seen God do great things, but the greatest thing i ever seen in my life was love. It's the most powerful force that stops anything there is, is love. Love that moved a mighty God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Love is a great keynote, thing we, lay, we leave out. It's something that's eternal. I was speaking today, coming down with Brother Moore. I said, take like the love, uh, uh, the love, a natural love, affectionate love, called filial love. Godly loves the gospel. But in the filial love, you go out, <coughs> you see Mary and Martha. You're going with Martha, say, and, and uh, you find Mary. There's something about Mary that's different from Martha. So Martha's the prettiest, but yet you love Mary the best. Now, if he's a Mary and Martha here, I don't, I'm just using that as a, you know, <laughs> so, um, but you find it's the girl that you love. There's something about her as soon as you see her, you know you love her. You think, oh my, if I could only just get one date with that girl. Well, finally you do. You think it'd satisfy that feeling. It doesn't. Then you think, if I could go with her study, that would do it. Finally you get to go with her study. It doesn't. If she just let me kiss her goodnight sometime, that would do it. But finally that happens and it doesn't. Well, if she'd marry me, I know it would do it. It doesn't. Even family relationships, you love her so much, feel like you could pull her all the way through you and reach back and pull her back again. Trying, trying to, that's a rude expression, I didn't mean it like that. But I, I mean what I'm trying to say. You love her, love her, love her. There's no place you can find. What is it? She's part of your soul. She's part of you. And that's right. That's, that's in a, uh, that's the way God is. When you come and find Christ in your heart, there's no place you can stop. You just keep moving on. This meeting, that meeting, this thing, that thing. It's the love of God, how rich and pure, how fabulous and strong. It shall forever or induce saints and angels songs. Or uh, people trying to measure God's love. One of them wrote, If we would think the ocean filled and was the skies of parchment made, Every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade. To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. My, and could the scroll contain the whole, those steps from side to side. Amen. What the love of God is. So that's what we believe in. Love one another. John, had to return from the Isle of Patmos, out in the, in the Asian Sea, only thing he could say is, little children, love one another. He found there was something real, and that was a disciple that wanted to call fire down on the city and burn him up because he wouldn't give him enough beans. But how Christ got a hold of him, and they know you don't know what kind of a spirit you are, he says, trying to destroy life, we come to save life. That's what we have to have is love for one another. In my ministry since the scene, I've been practically over the world, several trips overseas, seven or eight trips, amongst heathens and everywhere. And I find this, that the most forceful thing I can think of is love. If I'm praying for a person, if I can't have the feeling of that person upon my heart, it never works. But I can think, well, what if I was standing in their place? What if that was my baby? What if that was my mother, my wife, my sister, my brother? When you feel the way for them, then something begins to move out. Compassion. Goes out and catches the patient, brings them back. My friend... I know that God loves you. And now we don't want to take too much of the time because I just want to read a scripture or two and kind of talk for a moment or so to a few moments rather to find out just kind of the feeling of the Spirit. Now each one of you is a spirit. You know that. You're flesh. you got a body. But that's yours. Who are you inside of it? See? That's your spirit. That's what we have to catch. Is that in the inside? We pray and ask God to help us. Now let us bow our heads just a moment as we approach Him in prayer. You on the outside, the Lord bless you. Looking through the window, seeing people bowing their heads on the outside, real staunch Christians. Gracious Lord, we are now come together and so happy because that we can and have fellowship one with another while the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. I just think of the many dangers, toils, and snares we've been through since we met here before in Beaumont, Texas. 
How many we could stand up tonight and testify each of us what we've been through since that time and to think that the grace of God has brought us safe thus far. We believe he'll, his grace is sufficient to take us through. I thank you for this church, for this people, for the associating churches, for all your children throughout this country here. God, I believe Texas will be represented greatly in glory. For the gallant ministers, your servants, has crossed the state and has brought forth a gospel and a people for your kingdom. I thank you for every one of them. God, bind our hearts to close together with the ties of love, that there's nothing present, future, or could come that could separate us from the love of God that's in Christ. Grant it, Lord. Now, we are approaching you to ask mercy tonight. I suppose the greater part of this people in this church tonight are members here. I pray, Father, that you will come in mighty power and will heal every sick or afflicted person that's in divine presence. We realize that this blessing is a blessing that you have given to the believer. You promised it, and we believe every word of it to be the truth. I pray that the great Holy Spirit tonight will grant these blessings, and we'll praise thee for it in the name of the Lord Jesus. And Father, we trust that in this coming, finishing of this week, and as long as you would have us to be here, may souls be saved first. May those who do not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit come in and find fellowship with God and walk in the Shekinah glory of his presence by the baptism of the Spirit. We pray that you'll help your servants, Lord, the ministers, my brethren, your children. May they be so inspired that they'll take a new hope, leaving the meeting with a determination, Lord God, to pack the gospel farther than they ever have yet. Give them souls for their hire. Great miracles and signs may follow their ministry to lift up the Lord Jesus. Bless every church, fill every church to the capacity, Lord, and may we drive our tent stakes far beyond the boundaries now. May we drive it even beyond denominational boundaries, Lord, that we might throw out a loving arm to all creatures of God throughout the country, draw them into the fellowship of the Lord Jesus. Grant it, Lord, and we'll praise thee, for we ask this blessings in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. In the gospel readings tonight, just for a short time now before we start to the prayer line to pray for the sick, now my son, or Mr. Gold over here, or Mr. Mercer, uh, three of my associates in the ministry, or perhaps Brother Moore. Some of them will be at the church each evening to give out prayer cards wherever they go to have the service for that night. Many of you remember the way we did it the last time, giving out the prayer cards, and then somewhere when we get in there, well, we start from some number and call a group of people to the platform, and sometimes we don't even give out prayer cards and, and just bring them up at random, and uh, sometimes just the Holy Spirit goes out of the audience and gets them anyhow. So. It's not prayer cards don't have anything to do with, the, with your healing. A prayer card has nothing to do with it. It's your faith in God. If God continues on as he has been, you'll find that out in the next night or so. That sometimes where one year on the platform getting healed is 50 out there as people. And not everyone comes on the platform is healed. God heals according to your faith. Not according to your membership, not according to your righteousness. I've seen a saint go by and miss her healing and a prostitute walk behind it and get healed. See, it's according to your faith. It's based upon your faith. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. Now, turn to St. John, the 12th chapter, and we're going to read the first, uh, I'll read two verses of the 12th chapter of St. John, the 20th and 21st verse, not to preach, but just to Get a little quotation for the anointing to get into the building and out of the building, wherever it may be, that God might heal the people tonight. 
Now, I want you to keep your mind straight on one thing, on the Lord Jesus. I remember, no man is a healer. That's wrong. All, all that God could do for us was done for us at Calvary. And there is where every plan, the plan of salvation, where the atonement for healing and for salvation, where every attribute of his life to be reflected to us, it was met at Calvary and finished. You say, salvation? Brother Bram, I wasn't saved at Calvary. Well, if you wasn't, you'll never be saved. Right. You were saved 1,900 years ago. You said, no, no, brother, I was saved last week. No, you accepted it last week. But the price was paid. You were actually saved 1,900 years ago. You were healed 1,900 years ago. Now, when do you want to accept it? Now? All right. That's the time to do it. Now. Now, the work is finished. Everything is finished. All, the comp all we have need of in the journey from earth to glory is completed in Christ. And Christ in you. When a tree, you people here in Texas are great on fruit. When a little tree set out about that size, say a little peach tree. Uh, my mother come from Paris, Texas, so I'm just a little bit of Texan, you know. So, um, and that's to love it real well. <laughs> And his people. Now, on a little tree, she comes to peach country. A little tree, no more than one half inch high. Did you know every peach that will ever be in that tree is in it then? If it isn't, where does it come from? It's planted in the ground. And it has to grow. And it has to drink. And it drinks from the water of the earth and in there brings in the vitamins and so forth bring it in from the earth as a drink and it drinks over its allotted potion so more it drinks the farther it pushes out it pushes out limbs then it pushes out leaves then it pushes out blossoms then it pushes out peaches well that's the way a Christian is when we are planted in Christ Jesus the inexhaustible fountain of life Everything we have need of is in a sand. We just keep drinking and pushing out. Drinking and pushing out. If we have need of more of God, just keep drinking and pushing out. If we need healing, just drink and push out. That's all. Just God told Joshua, every foot of ground, wherever you're, every piece of ground that your foot steps upon, I'll give to you for a possession. So footprints meant possession. And God's given us every blessing that we have need of and will ask for, and the only thing we have to do is take it. Amen. Now, God's not going to bring it and give it to you. You've got to go get it. Sure. You understand now, everyone? We've Amen. got to possess it. It's ours. God told Moses down in Egypt, I'll give you the lion, but it was invested with Amorites, Hittites, and all different kinds of ites and mites. But... God could have went up there and caused a storm to come by and slept it all out and said, Come on in, children. He doesn't do it that way. He said, I'll give it to you. Now go take it. Now, it depends on what you look at. There was uh, many of the spies that went to spy out, come back, ten of them, and brought back a bad report. We can't do it. It would mire us. They're bigger than we are. All that. But two had the evidence. Two come back because it depends on what they were looking at. The others was looking at the Amorites and the Hatites and so forth. But Joshua and Caleb was looking at God's promise. Therefore, they said, we're more than able to do it. Now, what are you looking at tonight? Look at God's promise and keep drinking and pushing. And if you do that, something's going to take place. If I didn't think I'd be a blessing to you, I certainly wouldn't come here. I, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't come tell you something to deceive you. Because if I didn't know it to be the truth, then I'd stay home. I'd come down, shook your hand, visit with you, went home, see who had the best cook, and, and then come on, went on back home, went fishing with you or something other, or, or something like that. But I know that the things that I'm speaking of, divine healing, salvation, those things are real, more real than we're sitting here. Now let's believe it with all of our heart as we read. St. John 
12th chapter, 20 and 21st verse. There were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethesda of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. And now, if I call it a little text, a little talk, I want to take Hebrews 13, 8. That's been the, my theme all through these years. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, let's just ask ourselves this question. These people come, and I believe that each one of we tonight are just like they were. They had heard about Jesus, so they wanted to see him. And I, I don't believe there's anyone could ever hear that lovely person of the Lord Jesus, but what his whole heart's desire is to see him. When I first heard that name, there's just something such sweetness to it. I, I wanted to see him. Well then... If they was desiring, they were human beings like you and I are, and they'd heard about him, and they'd come up to see him, and their desire was to see him, and they had the privilege of seeing him. Now, if Jesus Christ is, and God forgive me for saying if, I don't mean to be sacrilegious, but uh, to make a point, if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we have the same desire, then why can't we see him? If he's still the same. Now, he has to be the same if the Bible says he's the same. He's the same Savior, the same healer, and just the same as he was. The only thing different in him, he's now in an invisible body. That's where he was in a visible body. But he promised it a little while, and the world won't see me no more. Yet ye shall see me. For I, and I as a personal pronoun, I will be with you even in you to the end of the consummation or the age. Now, if he is the same and promised that ye, now a little while and the world, that's the cosmos which means the world order, won't see me no more, yet ye shall see, that's the church of believers, for I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world. Then that makes him the same yesterday, day, and forever. St. John 14, 12, he said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. Amen. So we see the scriptures, we can't deny those scriptures. They are there. Now, if we have in faith to make them answer, well, let's just say, I believe it, but I haven't got faith to do it. It's just like, I wish I had faith like Enoch had. One day he walked with God after 500 years, had a testimony that pleased him, and just got tired of keeping his feet on the ground, took a little afternoon walk, went up home with him. I wish I could do that. But if I haven't got the faith to do it, I'll not stand in somebody's way that has got faith to do it. I'll thank God for that faith that can do it. And that's why when we think we see something healed, others miss it. What is it? It's just like a faith, that's all. God doesn't, doesn't treat his children one one way and one another. It's based upon faith, and we must believe it. Now, if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and forever, then if we could ask that same question, I hear we are many of you people that's been serving God when I was a baby boy, a sinner. You were serving God. And I think that we have a right to come and ask God that same question that these Greeks asked. Sir, we would see Jesus. We want to see him. And uh, I wonder this tonight. Would that be, the, would that be what this a group of children of God here at Beaumont, Texas would you like to would you like to see him? I would sure love to see him. I w is it possible that we can see him? Do you think so? Yeah. Certainly. We got many ways we could see him. If the person's not spiritually blind, I saw him this afternoon when the sun was setting. <laughs> I see him out on the foamy waves of the deep. I see him in the morning star and in the evening star. Yeah. I hear him scream in the eagle when he comes down across the mountain. I hear him howl in the wolf. I hear him, I hear him bugle in the elk, grunt in the deer. Well, certainly, I hear him crying a baby. You know, he was once the baby himself. Talk about a sign. Isaiah 9, when they asked for a sign, God gave him a super sign. A virgin shall conceive and bear a child. 
His name shall be called Counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. It should have been striking. Jehovah baby. Jehovah God, a baby crying in a manger over a pile of manure in the, in the manger. It ought to have been striking. Jehovah, a teenage boy playing Jehovah driving nails as a carpenter. Oh, my. And above all, Jehovah nailed to a cross to save sinners. It should have been striking. We could see him. He isn't dead. How long ago I was talking to Mexico. Brother Jack was there that night. About, about 30,000 people gathered together. And we were praying and God was performing signs and miracles. And there's a little woman down there. She had a baby. And the little thing died at 9 o'clock that morning. It's about 9 o'clock that night. It was raining. And, and so uh, Billy comes to me. He said, Daddy, there's no way of keeping that woman out of the line. He said, you just can't control her. He said, she's, she's beyond herself. And I said, well, uh, did you all give out prayer cards? And the brother's name, uh, we just called him Manana because he was so slow. So he's the one to give out the prayer cards. He said, but she hasn't got a prayer card. He hasn't got any more. And I said, she's been standing here and she didn't get a prayer card. So we got a bunch of ushers. They can't even keep her out of the line. I said to Brother Moore, you go down and pray for the baby. He sent Brother Moore down. And so when Brother Moore started to go down, I looked out in front of me and I saw a little baby, little Mexican baby sat before me just gooing and laughing. I said, wait, maybe I'd better go down. And so the little blanket was wet. They brought her and as soon as she comes, she began to crying out, Padra, Padra. I said, just a moment, lady. She couldn't speak English. And she had the baby under a blanket. Put my hands up on the little baby and I said, Lord Jesus, just a few moments ago you showed me a vision. Uh, is this that little baby that you showed me been dead since that this morning? And that was sitting laughing. And while I began to pray, the little fellow began to kick and scream underneath that blanket. And I said, now don't write it up till you go let the doctor sign the statement that the baby died this morning at 9 o'clock. And he did. Now, what is it? God is life. He is life, eternal life, the Lord. Call back the spirit of that dead baby into that little fellow's body. Now, God, if he is so great, here some time ago up at where I live on the Ohio River, there was a, a little boy that used to go down to the river and he would associate with an old fisherman. He used to come to my church. He had long white beard. There's a place just up above us called the Six Mile Island. We used to fish up there, and the old fisherman had his nets and things out up there, so the little boy would ride up the river with him to run these nets. And um, so the little boy went to Sunday school there in the city, and he went one morning and asked his mother, he said, Mother, said, last Sunday, he said, my Sunday school teacher was telling how great God is, that he covers all space. He never did begin, and so forth. said, if he's a great, uh, if he's that great, then he's greater than I am. And said, if he's great, is that great, he's greater than the mountain. If he's that great, he's greater than the river. And said, I can see all those things, so why can't I see God if he's that great? That's a pretty good question. So she said, now look, honey, I'm not a Sunday school teacher. You go ask your Sunday school teacher. Well, went to Sunday school teacher. She said, I can't answer that. Go to the pastor. And the pastor said, why, no, sonny. No man can see God. Said, well, how, him being that great, we can't see him? He said, no, no one can see him. Well, I said, he didn't like that answer very well, but he went on because that was the highest order he could, thought he could go to was the pastor. So one day coming down the river with the old fisherman, there come up a storm, and the old fisherman pulled into the bank and so as the storm was over, the, the two started down the river together and all oh, how the air so fresh after a rain and, and the sun was going down in the west and in the east there come a rainbow. And the little boy sitting in the, in the stern of the boat, the old fisherman pulling the oars, he noticed running down over his gray beard was great big white crystal tears. And the little boy looked around to see what he was looking at is a rainbow. So they had, the religion hadn't been named among them for some time, so he went up to the front, to the center of the boat, and he said to him, he said, Sir, I'm going to ask you a question. My mother's Sunday school teacher or pastor cannot 
or satisfy me. He said, God made that rainbow, didn't he? He said, yes, sir, he did, son. He gave that a promise that he'd no more destroy the world by water. He said, if God is so great, sir, if he's so great, then why can't I see him? And the old fisherman, overcome by the little boy's question, pulled the oars in the boat and put his arms around the little boy and hugged him up to his breast, pulled him up, looked in his face. He said, God bless your little heart, honey. All I've seen for the past 40 years has been God. He had so much God on the inside, he could see him on the outside. Now that's the way you have to see God is get him on the inside and let him look through your eyes. But, you know, the church has become more or less like a paralyzed condition. It becomes too common, these things. Here some time ago there was a lady in the Louisville, Kentucky, I believe it was, and had a little boy walking around through the 10 cent store uh, jingling little things and she's trying to show him the little boy just sat staring. So she, ever, uh, people begin to notice this, she got hysterical. And she'd say, look, honey, look. And the little boy just stared. So she'd go to another counter and get something off to attract the little lad of his age and say, look, honey, and he'd just stare. And so finally, so overcome and exhausted, she just fell over the counter and began to scream, no, no, no. And the people that was in the store went to her and said, What's the matter, lady? She said, My little boy. She said, Something happened to him. She said, Not long ago, he was a jolly little fella, but something happened to him, and he just sits and stares in space. Said, Nothing that ought to attract the little boy of his age will attract him. He just stares. Said, I took him to the doctor, and the doctor said he was all right. But said he isn't. Because he won't look at nothing that he ought to look at for a child his age. And said he just completely stares in space. Well, that's just about the condition the churches is getting into. Yeah. The thing, God shook every kind of a miracle inside before the church and still they kept staring in space. It's like, they didn't know. God in his great power in these last few years has shook this nation yeah. like never before. Shook the nation, you say... The nation of the United States, the nation, his nation, his kingdom. God doesn't promise to shake a nation like that. He promises to shake his church. Amen. It's not a nation-shaking message. It's a church-shaking message. Amen. Come to his church to wake them up. The nation won't believe it anyhow out there. Jesus never went to a nation. He went to his own. His own received him not. He never come to a world. Thousands and thousands never knew he was even in Palestine during his visit. But... It's sent to the church. Now, if I say to you Methodist brethren, uh, is Jesus Christ the same yesterday and forever? You'd say, yes, we have him in the Methodist church. We know he is. The Baptists would say the same thing. Each church would say the same thing. We got about, of course, about six or eight hundred different denominations, so somebody's got to be right and somebody wrong. It just can't be everybody right or everybody wrong. It's got to be right and wrong there somewhere. So now, if I approach it in a Baptist standpoint, or in a Methodist standpoint, or a Pentecostal standpoint, or whatever I approach it in, it would be doing discredit to the other brethren. That's right. But now let's approach it from a fact. Let's approach it from a Bible standpoint. Let's find out what he was yesterday. And if we can find what he was yesterday, then he'll be the same today. Regardless of our theology, they say he was the same. Now, well, if we can find out what he was yesterday, then we'd find out what he is today. Amen. Now, if I could go out and get a man and put nail scars in his hands and, and thorn prints on his forehead, that would be, that could be deceived because that, that man could be an imposter. He could be impersonating Jesus Christ. The only way that we'll ever know what he was was to find his life moving in his church. But let his life, if a, if a pumpkin vine bears a pumpkin, this pumpkin life in the pumpkin vine. You can't get gourds off of it because it's a pumpkin. If it's a watermelon, it's a watermelon comes off of a watermelon vine. If it's a Christian vine, it'll bear a record of Christ. Amen. So let's find out what he was yesterday, then we see what he is today and what he will be forever. I think that gives all of us a fair look. Let's go back now to St. John, the first chapter, and find out what he was. We're reading in St. John, 
And we could go back here to the, the first chapter of St. John and we would read this. Now, let's start at the beginning of his life and take a few verses here. And then the first thing you know, tomorrow night we'll pick up some more and just keep finding what he is as we go along. But being it, we haven't got but just about 12, 14 more minutes uh, before we start the prayer line. Let's think of what he was yesterday. Now we find him here in St. John, like all the other Gospels begin. We find him at, a, at his birth, and we know how mysterious that was, that he was the Son of God, but a very seed of the woman promised in the Garden of Eden. And then we find out that at the age of 30, he was baptized in the river of Jordan by John the Baptist. And when he was baptized, going straightway out of the water, we find that the Holy Spirit, God, like in the form of a dove, coming from heaven and a voice saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am pleased to dwell. And the right translation of that, but who I am pleased to dwell in. Because God was in Christ. And now, when he came down upon him, he became the anointed one, the Messiah. We find out then temptation into the wilderness and immediately returning from his temptation, he went about healing the sick, casting out devils, setting the people at liberty. Let's see then. The first thing that he did was start preaching the gospel and healing the sick. All those that were oppressed of the devil. Now let's take some of his signs. Now, is he a Messiah? Now we realize that they've had divine healing even before he come on earth. How I many knows that? The pool of Bethesda was a healing sign, and down through the ages they've had all kinds of healing. But there was supposed to be a sign following this Messiah. He had a Messiah sign. And if he was Messiah, which is the anointed one, the Christ, then there was to be a sign of Messiah follow the Messiah. There's a sign follows the believer. You believe that? Amen. God is a God of signs, wonders, and miracles. And if he was that the first time, he's that the second time, he's that the third time, he's that every time. Remember, when you read the Word of God, as we Protestants believe it to be the infallible Word of God, then when God is ever called on the scene to act and has to make a decision, the way God acts on that case, He has to act on every case thereafter, the same. Because I can make a decision today and it could be right. Tomorrow I might make the same decision it would be wrong because it was wrong at the first place maybe. But when God ever makes a decision, it's perfect. Because we are finite. We make mistakes. God's infallible and infinite and cannot make a mistake. Therefore, what God said is perfectly right. And if he was ever called on the scene to save a sinner, the attitude he took towards that sinner, he'll have to take the same attitude towards every penitent sinner from thereafter. Amen. If he's called on the scene to heal a sick person, the attitude he took towards that sick person, every sick person comes to him, he must act the same way or he did wrong when he acted the first time. There's God. Is that right? Amen. So what Jesus was yesterday he has to be the same today or he was wrong yesterday. Right. His Messiah sign that he showed to the people then, if that was wrong, then he, he'd have to say the same thing today. And if it isn't, it has to be right because he was God. And now, if he was right then and that was the sign, it's the same sign today and will be forever. Amen. Now we'll take some of his actions. Immediately after he started preaching, there was Andrew, you know, and then it started the following. Asked him where he lived. Asked to see him on the Jordan that day. He was baptized with John. And then Andrew went and found his brother Simon and brought Simon to him. Come see now, we found the Messiah. Simon was a fisherman. And when he come up into the presence of the Lord Jesus, standing there, what was the first thing Jesus did? No doubt, looking straight in the face and said, your name is Simon. You are the son of Jonas. Peter had been taught, Simon, rather, he is called Cephas, that which is interpretation of stone. What was he? He believed that because he had a father that had taught him that when the Messiah come, the real true Jew believed that when the Messiah come, he would be a prophet. The Jew always believed in their prophets. We know that. 
Because Moses said, the Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like unto me. He was the God prophet, the master prophet, the God of the prophets. But his son was to be a prophet. And they were watching for that prophet. Don't you remember? He said, Art thou that prophet? Art thou that prophet? Ask John, are you that prophet that was to come? He said, Who does man say I am? Some say you're Elias to Moses, and some that prophet that was to come. They know that he was to be a prophet. And when Simon, Peter, when he told him, Your name is Simon, and your father's name is Jonas, he knew right quick that was the prophet that had been prophesied of coming. That was sign of Messiah to him. Although he didn't have enough education to sign his own name. But he fell at the feet of Jesus and was given the keys to the kingdom later. Because he received God, he knew what was the following. He knew that that was God. Sign of the prophet. Then there was one standing by by the name of Philip. Coming right down to first chapter of St. John. And Philip thought this was wonderful. And when he seen this, he was satisfied that that was the prophet that was spoke of the Messiah. So, if that was Messiah yesterday, and the sign of Messiah yesterday, he'll be sign of Messiah today if he's the same Messiah. Right. It'd be the same thing. That's how he declared to them that he was Messiah. Now, Philip had a good friend by the name of Nathaniel. Was you ever in Palestine to see where the place was? About 15 miles around the mountain. He ran over there and his fair friend's name was Nathaniel. So when he goes over to find Nathaniel to tell him this good news, there's something about it. If you're ever convinced that Jesus is the Christ, you can't keep it to yourself. You've just got to tell everybody about it. Come on. I just can't see how people can find this wonderful love of God and hold still with it. Oh, my. This I asked somebody not long ago, I said, you've been a Christian for so many years. I said, does your neighbor know it? I said, no, we can't keep it to yourself. Uh, oh, my. You can't do that. Uh, oh, a sister in our church used to sing, sing a song. Uh, I'm running, running, running. I want to tell it. <laughs> well, that's about right. You just got to tell somebody you can't stand still. Something has happened and you know it's happened. So he was convinced that that was the Messiah. Let's take a little drama for a moment. I can see Nathaniel take out around about a day's journey around the mountains over the cobblestones and finally come to the house where Nathaniel lives. He knocked at the door. And so Mrs. Nathaniel comes to the door. She said, Why, Philip? Well, I'm glad to see you. He says, Where's Nathaniel? Well, uh, Philip, uh, he just took a walk out in his... his uh, uh, orchard out there. He's, he's back there somewhere. You'll find him. He's looking over his, his olive groves back there, or fig trees and so forth. He's back there in the grove somewhere. You'll find him. And I haven't seen Nathaniel going down through there, uh, uh, Philip rather trying to find him. And after a while, he was on his knees praying. That's a good place to be. Amen. So, uh, and usually that's when you find Christ, when you're on your knees. That's Amen. a good way. See, stay on your knees a lot. Good. And when he was under this tree praying, I can imagine, of course, Philip, a Christian gentleman, why well, he just stood and waited till he got through praying. I can see Nathaniel get up and dust off his knees like that and say, Oh, bless the Lord. That, I thank you, Lord. He turned around and said, Philip! Now, he didn't say, How's all the archers getting along? See? Uh, how's all the folks? And how's John, Joe, and all that? You know? He didn't say that. He said, Come see who we have found. Oh, it was just bubbling over. You had to say something about it. I like that. Oh, I believe the Holy Ghost really feels just bubbling over. David said his cup runs over. Somewhere in the Holy Ghost gets a hold of it, he just bubble over. He didn't have no time to talk about the farm. He said, come see who we have found. The Messiah. We have found Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Come see who we found. This is the prophet that was spoke of. I can imagine this dignified, uh, orthodox believer. But now wait just a minute, Philip. <clears throat> I, I know you to be a good man and a good man. What kind of a tantrum have you gone off on? What deep end have you fell into? Now there's something wrong with you somewhere. I've always known you to be a good sane person. 
So why are you coming up here with something like that, that you found somebody, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, you said, a city of Nazareth. Well, now, we know the Messiah's coming. And now if the Messiah would come, you know what happened? The quarters of heaven open up, he'd come right down to the head of our denomination. Yes, sir. He'd got right up on the, the canopies of, of the temple. And if he didn't come to our denomination, that ain't him. No, no. That ain't him. He's got to come to ours. You know, all of them Nathaniels isn't gone yet. <laughs> so he's just got to come to our group or he isn't coming at all. But you know, God does things the way he wants to. Yeah. It's, yeah. Our, yeah. We, we, it's his way. Right. So we find him saying, now could any good thing come out of Nazareth? And I think Philip gave him the best answer that any man could, said, come see Come and see. Don't stay home and criticize. Come see for yourself. Amen. That's the best. Uh, 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 he never, it's not, our denomination is not sponsoring it. We're not in the, cooperating with it. So I'll just stay home. and uh, Well, you'll never know then. That's <laughs> all. So, come see. Curse the scriptures, Jesus said. There are they to testify. Right. Yeah. Find out whether it's right or not. So he said, come and see. I can imagine us breaking on their conversation as they go along the side of the road. I hear Philip say to Nathaniel, Nathaniel, and you can't believe that? No. What does the scripture say? That the Lord our God shall raise up a prophet like it unto, um, unto Moses? That's yes. Well, is the Messiah going to be a prophet? Yes, he'll be a prophet. Will he show a prophet sign? Yes, he'll show a prophet sign, and that'll be the Messiah sign. Yes, it will. All right. Now, you know that old ignorant fisherman down there we bought that fish from that day he didn't have enough education to sign your receipt? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Oh, yes, Andrew's brother, Simon, yes, that was him. Big old burly looking fellow, bald-headed, greasy apron on, yep, that was him. Couldn't sign the receipt, yep, that's right. Well, you know, he come up before this one that we know to be the Messiah. Do you remember what his father's name was? Oh, sure, I had fellowship with him, Jonah. Yes, I know him, Jonah. <laughs> Well, as soon as he walked up in front of this man, he looked at him and said, Your name is Simon, the son of Jonas. Ah, what about that? Philip said, Ah, I mean, the thing on Philip said, It wouldn't surprise me if he would tell you who you are when you come up there. Oh, now wait. Ah, I don't know about that. Ah. And after a while, they arrived, and maybe Jesus is standing in the prayer line, or and maybe they come in the prayer line. I don't know. But maybe they, he was back out in the audience, wherever it was, when he walked before the Lord Jesus. Jesus turned and looked at him and said, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no God. <laughs> that took the wind out of his sail. Now you say, Oh, sure, the way he was dressed. No, no, all the Easterners dressed the same. They wore those robes and turbans and so forth, dark race of people. So, no, no, no. said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. If I'd said, A good, honest man. Good, religious, honest man. And he's right. And he started, started, stung him a little. He said, Rabbi means teacher. Well, when did you ever know me? Why, you don't know nothing about me. I've never seen you in my life, and you've never seen me in your life. How do you know that I'm an Israelite and an honest man? Listen. He said, before Philip called you when you were out of the tree, I saw you. <laughs> Death cannot dim them. They're alive forevermore. Amen. I saw you 15 miles around the mountain the day before. Yes. I saw you. What was his response? Rabbi, thou art the king of Israel. Thou art the son of God, the king of Israel. He never had any question. His name's immortal tonight among men. Fell down at his feet. Rabbi, teacher, you're not merely a man. You're the king of Israel. You are the son of God. We know that Messiah was to do that. There stood some by what didn't believe that, you know. They had their hands behind. They had to answer to their congregation because the congregation is going to bring them a question about it. They said, uh, <clears throat> uh, of course, uh, this man only does this by Beelzebub. He's a fortune teller, see? He does this by Beelzebub. Jesus said, I forgive you for that. But the hour is coming when the Holy Ghost will come. 
And he'll do the same thing. And one word against it will never be forgiven, neither in this world or the world to come. So you see where we're standing. But I forgive you. You speak that against me, I forgive you. Because they called, they said, the Spirit of God, an unclean spirit. Clashing the Spirit of God, discerning spirits, and a prophet, the God of eternity, standing there making himself known in a sign that was promised to him, the Scriptures being fulfilled in the very eyes, and so denominational bound until they... Well, he didn't come to our place, so it's the devil. Yeah. Yeah. We could really go to town on that for a little bit. That's these man's place. But notice, that was it. They said that the Holy Spirit would come someday and do the same thing. Now, that's the way, remember, there is only three tribes of people on the earth, if we believe the Bible, Ham, Sam, and Japheth's people. That's Jews, Gentiles, and Samaritans. Remember Peter with the keys on the day of Pentecost? Yeah. Then right down to the Samaritans and up to the Gentiles, and that finished it. Jews, Gentiles, and Samaritans. Now, we Gentiles, Anglo-Saxons, was not looking for no Messiah. He only comes to those who are looking for him. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I like for that to go home. <laughs> I hope that stands as high as the trees down here <laughs> before you. That you can't look without seeing it. He only comes to those who are looking for him. We Gentiles wasn't looking for none. We was looking for a Messiah. But the Jews and the Samaritans was. Well, we see how he made himself known. Oh, many other places we could take you on down. But let's turn over another page. We find them where he passed through a, a pool of Bethesda. And... Uh, a few days before that, a little woman, she tried to get the prayer line. She didn't have no prayer card, I suppose. And um, so she believed that if she could touch him, that she'd be healed. And so she couldn't get up to him and all the people were around him. And first thing you know, why she slipped through and touched the body of his garment. And he stopped and said, who touched me? Somebody touched me. Peter rebuked him. And he said, but I, I perceive that I got weak. Virtue went out of me. He looked around over the audience till he found her and told her that her blood issue had stopped because her faith had saved her. Yeah. Now, he never done it. Her faith in him done it. Yeah. You see it? Her faith. Thy faith has saved thee. And I want, man, you're who's more eloquent about this, Brother Lord and many of these other ministers, that same word there is sozo, which means saved for body or soul, just the same. Physically saved or spiritually saved, the same way you do it. She touched him. Now you say, but Brother Branham, I know what he, uh, she touched him, wonder if I could. The Bible says that he right now is a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. Is that right? Well, if he's the same high priest, if you touch him, you'd act the same way. So reach up and touch him tonight with your face. It wasn't, she not, well, you say, I close, I put my hands on his garment. It, that, didn't, that wasn't what done it. He couldn't have felt that. The Palestinian garment has an underneath garment and a big robe that swings out. Dust picked up under that robe, that's the reason they had feet washing and so forth, to get the dust off their feet. So they, they, the Palestinian garment out like that, she never touched the touching that border, why didn't you feel all these that had their arms around him? Hello, Rabbi, glad to meet you, Reverend, and so forth. Why didn't he feel them? They touched him more than she did, but he touched the, she touched the inside. Yeah. Said, I felt virtue go from him. A few days after that, he passed through the pool of Bethesda, and there was a man laying there that had an infirmity. There were all kinds of people, uh, lame, blind, halt, withered, every kind of affliction. Jesus walked right around through them all, looking around, until he seen a man laying on a pallet. I guess you'd call it that. All of us Southerners know what a pallet is, don't we? I was raised on one. So, uh, laying on a pallet, laying there, and he wasn't crippled, blind. He had, let's say he had prostate trouble, or he might have had uh, TB. It was retarded. It wasn't going to kill him. He'd had it 38 years. Jesus looked around until he found him, and he said, uh, will thou be made whole? He said, sir, I have no one to put me in the water. When I'm coming, somebody outruns me. In other words, gets me in the water first. See? Ahead of me, steps down ahead of me. 
He said, take up your bed, go into your house. See? Watch, the Bible said, for Jesus knew. See? Now he was questioning on that, John 5. And John 5, 19, when he was questioning, he said, Dearly, dearly, I say unto you, the Son, the body, the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father doing. For the Father worketh, and I worketh hitherto. I do nothing until I see. Then if he saw, he saw the Father by vision doing the work. God showed him by vision what to do, and he went and done it. Look at the resurrection of Lazarus when he comes to the grave. You notice at the grave, he said, I, I thank thee, Father, that's already heard me. He knows what was going to happen, but I say it for thee to stand by. Lazarus, come forth! Lazarus raised. Oh, my, sure, because he had seen it done. He said he did nothing until the Father showed him. He never said anything about virtue leaving him. Man, how great a miracle that was than the woman. But you see, that was God using his gift. That was the woman using God. But she had to come when she could. So she comes up with her water pot, and she's more, perhaps thinking what she had about the night before, and she left the pot down to get the water. Once she windled it up like this with the windle and set it down, she looks at it, she hears somebody say, Woman, bring me a drink. And she looked over, and there sat a Jew sitting over there. Now, she was a Samaritan. She said, it's not customary for you Jews, uh, uh, you being a Jew here, ask me a Samaritan woman. He was a young fella. Well, he's really only 30 years old, but the Bible claims that he looked 50. You know that? I guess his, his work. Read him up a little. He said, you're over St. John 6. He said, you're a man now over 50 years old and say you've seen Abraham? He said, before Abraham was, I am. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. See? Now, but he looked 50, I suppose, said, you're a man not over 50 years old. Now, but when she seen this Jew sitting there, she said, it's not customary for you, a Jew asked me, a woman of Samaria, such a thing as that. We have no dealings with one another. She said, but if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. She said, well, see, now what was he doing? You have to take my word for this. He was contacting her spirit. He was trying to find his spirit. See, the father had sent him up there. He had me go by Samaria. But when he got up there, he didn't know no more to do than wait, man. He said, say the same thing here tonight. Father sent me to Beaumont. I have to wait to see what he's going to say. I, I don't know. Just wait. I, we find out after a while whether he did or not. See? And then he sat down there and talked to her. What was he doing? Contacting her spirit. And he found where her trouble was. Anybody know what it was? Sure. She had five husbands. Six, really. She had five husbands. One you're living with now is not your husband. All right? And he said... A uh, woman, uh, go get your husband to come here after he found her trouble. She said, I don't have any husband. Or said, you said the truth. Said, you said the truth because you've had five. And the one you're now living with is not yours. So therefore, you said the truth. What did she do? She wasn't like some of them self-styled priests with their collars turned around with all the theology in the country. She knew more about God than half the preachers in the United States know. And her in that condition. She turned around and said, sir... I perceive that thou art a prophet. Yes. Amen. Said we know, we Samaritans, we know that that will be the sign of the Messiah. Is that right? right? We know the Messiah, which is called Christ, when he comes, he'll tell us these things. But who are you? Oh, uh, he said, I'm he that speaks to you. Brother, she drank from a new fountain then. She left that water pot there and run into the city as hard as she could. Listen to what she said. Come see a man who's told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? And the Bible says the man of that city believed Christ because of the woman's saying. If that was a sign of the Messiah yesterday, it was a sign of Messiah today. Is that right? Right. Now, one more quotation. It's a little long. But you forgive me for just a minute longer. This is church, I suppose. We don't have to close at no certain time. Amen. I want you to get this one more quotation. Then we'll close. Now, did you notice that sign never was performed before a Gentile? They wasn't looking for it. It was gone. It was a sign to the Jew and to the Samaritan. But the gospel never even comes to the Gentiles until Peter went and preached them at uh, 1049. Okay. They were heathens. So he didn't come to unbelievers. He came and showed his Messiah sign to the believers. Now listen close. 
You outside all of it put on spiritual thinking now because you're going to have to read between the lines here. Now I'll close. Now, when he was on earth here, they asked him what would be the sign of the coming of the end of the world. And he said, as it was in the days of Sodom, first he said of Noah, the rain. And when he said about Noah, he went ahead and gave what happened in the days of Noah, about the morals of the people, how immoral they would be, about uh, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. Then he comes to Sodom. He said, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Now listen close. Now notice, Abraham represented the elected and called out people. There's always three classes of people. Keep them in mind. Lot represented the lukewarm, formal church. The Sodomites was the world. Right. And Abraham had separated himself from all that unbelief and had come out. The elect church. Now remember, in the three angels that came to meet Abraham, they were three men. And they were three angels of God. One of them was God himself. Some minister said to me not long ago, you don't mean to say that was God. I said, the Bible said it was God. Abraham called him Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Elohim. He ought to know he's the one talking to him. He said, well, that was just a theophany. I said, a theophany don't eat a calf and drink buttermilk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was God. The Bible said he was. He was God, brethren. These three angels, he said, well, do you mean they were angels? I said, sure. In, in dusty clothes and eating? I said, sure. You just don't know how great our God is. Right. He wanted to come down to investigate the situation down in Sodom. So I can imagine, what if our body's made out of 16 elements? Potash, calcium, petroleum, cosmic light. He just reached over, he got 16 elements, went, <laughs> go together and said, come here, Gabriel. Step in here. <laughs> sure. Go one over there for Michael. Go to another for himself. <laughs> You step in and come down. Oh, I'm so glad I know him. Hallelujah. One of these days when my body's just just falling on the earth, you'll come back. I'm so glad I know him. God of that time. Just throw it together, that's all. Come on now, I promise you. You'll safe over a few things and make you ruler over many. Heir of all things, through Christ. You just don't realize who he is, how great he is. And he come down, and I want you to notice Two of those angels, the modern Billy Graham and so forth, went out and preached to the Sodomites. Is that right? Yes. And there's only one miracle they perform, smiting the blind, and the preaching of the gospel smites blind them who doesn't believe. Amen. But he showed that sign to them down there of the gospel being preached to come out. He didn't call Abraham out. He's already out. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. Abraham represented the elected church, the called out church. Amen. But one stayed behind with Abraham. And he done a sign. I want you to see what kind of a sign he done to the elected church. Now, you see, they had the gospel preached to come out of that place down there. But this one stayed behind with Abraham and said, <clears throat> I remember he was a stranger. Yeah. Had dust on his clothes. He come from a foreign country. Yeah, way away. And he said, Abraham, where is your wife Sarah? How did he know that he was married and how did he know he had a wife named Sarah? Uh Abraham, where is your wife Sarah? Now the Bible strictly states that he said, she is in the tent behind you. Behind the angel. The angel was God in human flesh. Watch. Said she's in the tent behind you. Watch this. I will visit you according to the time of life. And Sarah laughed within herself, not loud, went on the inside of the tent. And with his aunt back turned to the tent, he said, Why did Sarah laugh? What kind of a telepathy is that? What was it? It was a sign that she's just ready to burn. Now he said, As it was in the days of Sodom, and the world is in a Sodom condition now, just before the fire fell, the angel of the Lord comes back and dwells in human flesh 
and does the same sign to give the Gentiles the same Messiah sign it did to the Jews and Samaritans. Do you see it? He's got to. If he lets this church coast through on just mere theology, he'd give them a favor and a sign that he didn't permit to us. And if God is the same, and he is the same, he'll do the same and act the same to each one of his children and to every generation he has to be the same. If that was his sign in that day to the Jews, Samaritans, at the closing of their days, this is the closing of our days, the gospel returns again to the Jews pretty soon. He's waiting right now for it. Just waiting for the sign to appear to him. And then he will return, which Elijah and Moses will do that in Revelation 11, you know. Now, but then the Gentile church is at the end time. Is that right? We believe that. That this is the end time. And the Sodom burning is close to end. Well, the atomic bomb's already in the hangar around her. Right. With the world's name wrote on it. That's right. She's going to burn. Don't worry about that. Amen. It's going to burn. It's ready right now to be set off at any time. Just let some fanatic pull up. One of these missiles, one of these days, is going to get to somebody's screen, and then everybody's going to start turning loose That's in right. Then That is sure. But before that happens, the church is going home. The church is going home. It'll never be in that. Now, do you understand? But just at that end time, this sign is to appear again. It wasn't stopping. The elected church, not the lukewarm, they got there. But the elected, called out church, can you read between the lines? Called out church will receive that sign. And that was the sign of the Messiah. It's the sign of the Messiah among us. We are not Messiahs, but the Messiah lives in us, which Messiah means the anointed one. And it's got to anoint all of us. If it anoints one with a sign and the other doesn't believe it, what good would it do? It's got to be all of us together. And together, if Jesus Christ will appear here tonight and do the same Messiah signs that he did back there before the Jew and the Samaritan, would you receive him as your Savior and as your healer? Would you? That's a big statement. Receive him as your Savior. Now remember, he cannot heal. His first thing, he wants you to believe it. He's got a ordained man here to do that. But besides that, God put four... God called offices in the church. Amen. Apostles, which is actually missionary. Missionary means one cent. Apostle means one cent. All right. A missionary is an apostle. All right. Apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and pastors. I mean five instead of the fourth. It's five offices God ordained and put into the church. Amen. You believe that? Yes. Amen. All right. Then if we believe there's apostles, Amen. prophets, teachers, Pastors, evangelists, there are four offices in each local church. There's twelve or nine spiritual gifts. First Corinthians twelve. Nine spiritual gifts that operate through the body. See, God put every preparation to keep that church as clean as it can be without spot or wrinkle. Right, amen. We're at the end time, Gentile people. We're at the end time. I believe that Jesus Christ is still the Messiah. I believe if he come down there before Sodom and stood at the elect church. Remember, he never went out in Sodom. He came to the elect, to the church. These gifts are not sent. They want you to strike the big nerve centers. The nerve centers is God's people. Hmm? Come to the churches, the little places. You don't have to be flowerly. And that's what it is. Jesus wasn't a showman. They said to him, won't you come up to campus? Won't you go up here to Jerusalem? Show yourself. He said, your time's always. Mine hasn't come. Jesus wasn't a showman. That's right. He didn't show off. He said, you dwell in a bunch of holy rollers down there, a bunch of uh, fishermen and so forth. Come up here to the high class people. He came to those that God sent him to. Right. Yeah. We do these things because we're led to do these things. God does the leading of his children. I hope you caught that. Now, if he's the same yesterday today, and forever, then as far as healing, anyone comes and says they can heal you, that's wrong. That's unscriptural. That's right. He's already done it. If man says he can forgive your sins, he's wrong. They're already forgiven. Right, right. They're already forgiven. You just have to accept it. But there's pastors who can lead you. There's teachers who can teach. There's evangelists. There's other things. And there's prophets. And all these different things. And in the last day, this sign of the Messiah was to appear in the church. Now remember, how many ever seen that picture that was taken over here at Houston? It's, it's, all, it's here somewhere now, I guess. See? That's been taken all over the country. The same thing every time. See? Now, it's a pillar of fire. 
Now, when Jesus is on earth, how many believe that he was that angel that was with him in the wilderness? He said he was. His angel of the covenant. And he, here he said, I came from God and I go to God. Is that right? Amen. Then when he died, rose and resurrected. And one day, Paul, or Saul, was on his road down to Damascus and a light struck him down. Another light. Peter had come into the building, the prison, let him out. And this light come in to, to struck Saul down on his knees. He said, uh, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. Amen. I come from the pillar of fire. I return back to the same thing I was. Amen. Is that right? Amen. Now, the Bible said that's true. Well, then, if this is the right kind, if it is the same pillar of fire, then it'll do the same things he did. Amen. If that pillar of fire is with us tonight, if that's the Spirit of Jesus Christ, it'll act in you the way it acted in him. Amen. See what I mean? Then that makes it truth. Now, if we can see him come on the scene and act exactly like he did, would every one of you believe it was the Lord Jesus? Amen. Let us pray. Amen. Heavenly Father. Look like I could talk all night. Such a wonderful group of people. Their hearts just so, just like receptacles, Lord. Just pulling from you. How I love that, Father. And to know that I believe that this is the Abrahamic, the church that called out the elected church. With the gospel truth preaching it. Many, Lord, may not be able to crawl into the different signs, as I said, but they don't stand in others' ways who do. Lord God, they believe you. They believe the, the word. Many of them was preaching when I was a little boy, and here standing here tonight before such man. Men who hold the gospel truth in their bosom. Women, they got their wives here, their loved ones, children, they're sick and needy. They stood for this, they... Years ago, they was outcast, ousted from the other churches, stood on the corner with a tambourine in their hands. Some of the women not even enough money to buy stockings. They stood there with an old guitar in their hands and strummed it and proclaimed the message. God, the hour has come now. The hour is here. They paved the way, made straight the path in the wilderness. We pray that the Messiah of God will ride down that path tonight down into their midst. Show us, Lord, your presence. Sirs, we would see Jesus. This Jesus that they've talked about and stood under persecution of his name. Lord, appear in their midst tonight and show that you're still that same Messiah, that you're not dead. You're raised from the dead and you live in your church. You're the one that's with them all along. Grant it, Father. Just let us see you and every one of them will believe, Father. We commit ourselves to you. We pray that you'll grant this blessing through Jesus Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to ask you now, if everybody would just remain in their seat now for a few minutes. Now, I could stand here and talk of these things. But now, are they true? That's the next thing. Are they true? Many of you have never seen it, but you still believe it. You still believe it anyhow. But now, I don't know that he will, but I'm trusting that he will. And if he does act and do the same way that he did when he was sure on earth, now the only way he can do it is for me to submit myself to him, to heal myself and get myself out of the way, and you get yourself out of the way. Now that's the only way together then we'll see the Messiah. Just healing myself won't do it. Just, you have to yield yourself and I have to yield myself. And together, the Messiah works among us because we're His people. Amen. Chosen, sanctified by His blood. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. And He just, like that little button being the Holy Spirit, when you come in baptismal form, then it just begins to spread out. Yeah. When we get all the roots of bitterness and evil away from us, God just takes over and begins to move. Look at this microphone. That microphone is a, is a mute without something to speak in it. That ain't the microphone speaking. That's me. So it could be me speaking, it'd be him. <laughs> See, it could be you speaking, it's him. Amen. See, we know nothing of the future. We know not, I don't, there's not a person since I've been sitting here looking in this building that I know. Unless it be Brother Moore, Brother Brown, Brother Mercer sitting behind me, my son sitting there. 
I might know some of you men if I'd, you'd tell me who your name was or tell me where we met. I don't know. It'd be more likely to know the preacher. How many out this audience knows that I'm a stranger to you? Raise up your hand. Don't know nothing about you. Know nothing of your harm, your diseases, or troubles, or so forth. It's everywhere. Oh, wait a minute. I believe you, you get our cards. All right. We'll try prayer cards first. Now, we can't bring too many up here at a time. What was it, Billy? Was it the A? Prayer card A. Now, that's A, 1 to 100. We'll have to start from somewhere there. We start from some place, maybe tonight, tomorrow night, another place, next night, somewhere else. Just because we used to, we'd start. I, I gave my cards, many of you remember, and down in here. I used to, I'd give them to a fellow one time. He called him selling prayer cards to get somebody up in the prayer line. I stopped that right quick. I put my brother on it. Now, then my son come along. I put him to give them out, a trusted man. Then I'd come along for a while. I'd have little children like this to stand up. I could have little Junior here. I said, you stand and start counting, Junior. And wherever you stop counting, that's where I'll call from. Uh, believe it or not, we're still human. <laughs> Mama had Junior stop right at her number. <laughs> so I couldn't do it that way. Complaints come up. So one night in prayer, the Holy Spirit just said, and then the first thing I did, the first meeting, I went out and gave out everybody a prayer card. I give each pastor a hundred prayer cards to give out to his, I believe that's the way we've done it here the last time. I believe, in the Beaumont meeting. But the first man got his group in, that settled it for the rest of it, see? So he couldn't do that. The only way Justin we found to do it was give them out every day. Ever and that if a fella if he got prayed for he had to come the first meeting or he was out. Fella come the second day, he couldn't get a prayer card. Third day, no matter what, was he was obligated to pray for them first. See? So they didn't get in the prayer line. So now what we do is give them out have been for years, give them out all together, every day, and at that night we come down, it's wherever the Holy Spirit starts to deal with me. Sometimes I tell you how many's on this, how many's on this side, and divide them to this side. Start like that anywhere. We don't know. It's wherever the Holy Spirit puts on my mind. Then I know the man comes up to give you the prayer cards. The boys will come up before you first and take these prayer cards and mix them every one up before you. Then come out and give it. You might get number seven. You get 45 and you get 100 and like that. The next man to you, they're all mixed up. So therefore, when I come down, then that's double check that no one can say, well, they're selling prayer cards to get somebody in a prayer line. We can't do that. See, they're just all mixed up together. And then the Holy Spirit goes right on out and picks out those out there that hasn't even got a prayer card. Amen. Foretell the things. Oh, see, it's just I to get somebody up here so I can get the anointing on, on me and get the anointing on you. Get the Holy Spirit. So, tonight, let's just start from number one for the first of the See how many we get up. Number one, who has prayer card number one? If you can't walk now when your cards call, some of the brethren here will help you. Prayer card A, number one. Where is it at? Look at your prayer card now. Prayer card A, number one. Are you sure you give out prayer cards? Uh, um, all right. I have a lady come over here. She can walk because she is able to get up. Number two. Who has number two? Raise your hands quickly so we can see. Right here. Come right here, sister. Now, if you can't get up, just raise your hands and we'll come pack it. See? Number two. Number three. Would you raise your hand this way? Number four. Number four. We would do this to keep order. Let me show you something. How many in here wants to be prayed for? Raise up your hands. All over the whole building. All right? Who wants to be first? There you are. See? You have to do it. You just have to to keep order. Number one, two, three, four. Who has prayer card four? All right? Come here, lady. Number five. Who has prayer card number five? Come out over here, lady. Y'all line up now. Number six. Number six, back here. All right, number seven. Prayer card number seven, would you raise your hand? Prayer card seven. Well, somebody look at these people. There's a little crippled boy sitting over here, and two women and three over here in wheelchairs. Watch their prayer cards now. See? Number seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Number eight. Number eight, would you raise up your hand if you can? Way back. Number nine. All right. Ten. Number ten. Eleven. That's right. That's the way. Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. All right. Fourteen. Is it over there? Fifteen. Fifteen. Sixteen. All right. Seventeen. Eighteen. I missed it. Eighteen. 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 Prayer card 18. Well, that's enough. Let, let them stop right there for a minute. We start praying for these then. Now, remember, as your prayer cards call, fall right in line. All right. Now, now, 
Uh, here, sister, no, you, you get it. Is it. What number have you got there? 18. Oh, you can go right back there in the line right there. Just right back there, the boys will put you in the line. Here, right through here. Come through here, lady, around this way. Come up this way. Now, how many in your doesn't have a prayer card, and yet you're sick? Want God to heal you. All right? Raise up your hand. Right? I'm trying to get a, a idea of where you're at. <laughs> Just about general everywhere. All right. Now, if you don't have a prayer card, I'll tell you what I want you to do. You, without a prayer card, you do this. If the Lord begins to heal the people on the platform, then you look up there and say, Lord, He told me, and let's uh, ask these ministers here, does the Bible state now that Jesus now, in the book of Hebrews, is a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity? Yeah. Yeah. Well then, if He's the same high priest, if you touched Him, how would He ask? The same way He did yesterday. That's He's right. the same yesterday and today. Amen. Then he, it, now that doesn't make us Jesus, see, that just makes us His servants. Amen. We are His vessels that He is working through us. He, he uses man for His His vessels to work through. Isn't that right? Amen. All right. Now I want each person to keep in your position, keep real quiet, keep praying. Now I don't say that it will happen. Now remember, if I was, let's see, where is the Where's Jack help me? Oh, here, he, that's him. All right. Come on. Now, now these people here, now each one in the prayer line, I want to look at each one of them. Now, they're all strangers to me. I don't know them. If I'm a stranger to you all, hold up your hands. That is, I don't know you, know nothing about you or anything. Now, bring this lady here, please. Can you hear me all right? Now, sometime when that anointing strikes, I, I don't know how loud I'm talking. Can you hear me all right back there, the acoustic? If I was talking like this, could you hear me yet? Now, isn't this a wonderful thing? Here, this Bible's got to be found to be the truth or wrong. The promises of God has got to be found to be truth or wrong. Now, here's these people raise their hands. That they don't know me and I don't know them. You all have your hands up? Now, I'll tell you, if you're at least fitting out, just say, Lord Jesus, that man doesn't know me. And I know he's just a man. But I'm going to touch your garment, because I haven't got a prayer card. I'm going to touch your garment, then you turn him around and speak to me like the woman had touched your garment. Speak to me, and then that will convince me all my life. See? I just ask you to do that if he becomes anointed. Now, would you see Jesus? How would you see him? As he moves through us. I'd be in prayer. Now, I don't, now when I say be reverent and quiet, I don't mean uh, when, when we're standing here, see, I'm watching, don't nobody take a picture because it's a light. Last Sunday is a week ago, this same pillar of fire stood in my church for 15 minutes. Hundreds of people stood there crying, falling on their knees, and everything stood right there 15 minutes right before the whole audience they looked at it. Brother Gene, you was there, wasn't you? Brother Leo? No, let's uh, see. You are down here, that's right. You are down here in the south. Brother Gene? Some, uh, Brother Stoffman, he's supposed to be around here somewhere. Brother Fred Stoffman. Where you all at, brother? And somewhere here. They were there, yeah, back in the back. Stand there, look at it for 15 minutes, standing it right there in front of us, like that look at I trust that it'll show itself again here at Beaumont for you folks here. Remember, it's that same light that followed the children of Israel. It's the same one that struck Saul down. Come into the prison house. It's Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, a day, and forever. Sir, we would see Jesus. Now, Heavenly Father, this is as far as human beings can go. We are, we are now confessing our sins, all of our unbelief, and we're asking that you'll come with us tonight, that these words and promises, now you promised as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now I've tried to illustrate that to them tonight, Father, that we are Gentiles, this is when you were coming for the Gentile bride, the end of the age of the Gentiles. I told them 
and showed out of the Bible tonight how you proved yourself to be the people's Messiah to the Jews, the Messiah to the Samaritans. Now, Lord, show the same Messiah sign tonight that you are not dead but a living, and you're with your people to the Gentiles. By being dead in Christ, we are Abraham's seed, Lord, and are heirs with them in the promise. Let the Holy Spirit come tonight and take our, our beings, this whole church, in possession. Drive all unbelief from among us. And let the scripture that was quoted tonight serve we would see Jesus, and they got their heart's desire. May we find the same thing tonight, because it's written, Ask, and you shall receive. We commit it to you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Now, we don't know these people. I don't know this lady. She looks, I suppose, to be quite a bit older, maybe, than I. And I certainly never come here to deceive this poor gray-headed woman. I got a mother at home praying tonight. So who I'm thankful for, no doubt this is somebody's mother. Now we meet just exactly like St. John 4. Here's a woman, you don't know me, I don't know you. Now we raise our hands, I, I don't know you and you don't know me. Now here we are. Now, when Jesus met a woman that he never saw before, at the well of Samaritan City Public Well. It's in a little panoramic, something like this. And they met for the first time. And he spoke to her a few minutes till he found what her trouble was. And then told her what her trouble was. And then when he told her her trouble, she said, Sir, I, I perceive that you're a prophet. She said, We know that when a Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. But who are you? He said, I'm he. She went back and testified and told everybody, This man told me my trouble. Isn't that the sign of a Messiah? Now, would it be a sign of a Messiah to you if he comes tonight and you're, I'm a man, you're a woman, we met our first time, if he comes, tell me your trouble or something about you that you know I don't know, then if, to make it infallible, if he can tell you something that you have done, something back there, what you have done or have been, if he knows what you have been or done, well, he certainly can know what you will be. Is that right? For instance, if, like a gift of healing. No doubt but what that gift's all over the building tonight, many gifts of healing. Now, if I brought you up here, laid hands on you and said, Hallelujah, praise God. Some of our brothers have gifts of healing. They say, you're going to be well. Praise God, go on. Uh, that's right. I can believe that. Sure, I believe each of them brothers has gifts of healing. I think God will make them answer for the way to use it a lot of times, but I, you know, make money and things like that, but I, but I believe that it's gifts of God. I believe to be more reverent with them, gifts to be greater. And it will be. But I believe if a man come told you he had a gift of healing, he's a brother in Christ, I don't care what church he belongs to, I still say he's a man of God. If he laid his hands on you and said, I'll lay my hands on you, you go and you get well, I believe that. Sure. But... But you might have just a little bit of doubt whether he's going to get well or not. Because you just have to take his word for it. But now, if Christ comes and covers even all that, goes back down and talks to you about it, tells you something back there, comes up here and tells you what's wrong with you and what you've done, then you know that's got to be some kind of a power it has. Because we've raised our hands before this Bible and God and this audience. We don't know one another. But if he'll reveal to me something that's wrong with you, something that you've done, something that you ought not have done, or something you're trying to do or fixing to do, and you might be sent here for somebody else, might be financial trouble, might be domestic trouble, I don't know. I, I just, you're just a woman sent up. Does the audience understand that? Outside, do you understand that? Now, if Jesus is the same yesterday and forever, if she's needing anything, he's already provided for it. Only thing he can do is just make himself known. Now, if he was standing here with this suit on that he gave me, he could do no more than what he's doing right now. You'd have to believe that he did it for you. Because it's a finished work. Now, you all believe that. Now, if he will do that for this woman, how many will accept it out there and believe it? 
Now, in the name of Jesus Christ, I take every soul in here under my control. For the kingdom of God, sake. You're suffering with a hernia. That's right. That's right. Raise up your hand. You believe now? I caught that. Don't think that. Now you thought I guessed that. I didn't. Don't think that. Now you just ruined the meeting. You got to believe it. Come from somewhere. Don't think that. She's a fine person. She's a Christian. Got a good spirit. Not a hitchhiker. You're 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 a Christian. Because I feel you're, you could be a sinner. Behold, an Israelite, <laughs> there's no God. See, your spirit proves that you're a Christian. Yes, you have a hernia. You have an inward garter. You have gallbladder trouble, and you have heart trouble. That's thus saith the Lord. <laughs> That's right. Raise up your hand. <laughs> you believe now? You believe God knows who you are. You believe he can tell me who you are? Would it be the same thing you told Peter? Miss Roundtree, go home and believe, believe, believe with all your things. You know. Now you believe? Believe with all your heart. That started from the audience to you people out there. Be real reverent, just keep praying. Now the lady standing before me is a stranger. She's younger than I am. I never seen a woman, a man, meets together. I never seen her in my life. But God knows her. If we are strangers to each other, lady, are we? We are strangers. Just be real reverent. Now, I've never seen her, I don't know her, then if the Holy Spirit will reveal to me something about her, let her be the judge whether it's right or not. She's here for a spiritual problem. She's got spiritual trouble. You're praying for a child too, aren't you? Yes, sir. A little girl with eyes, bad eyes. Not here. That's right. You got a sister-in-law in the hospital. Oh, come on. Hush up. No. Yes, you believe God can tell me what's wrong with her? Yes. She's got pneumonia. Yes, and you believe with all your heart now? Go and have faith in God. You believe with all your heart? All your heart that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, lives and reigns? Now, you must believe with all your heart. Now, does, well, does that satisfy your desire, sirs, we would see Jesus? Now, how could I? Now, you'll have to say some kind of power is doing it. Now, if you want to call it a devil power, all right, you go ahead and get that reward. See? But if you believe it's Jesus Christ, just using his church according, I covered it completely with the Bible that it's God's promise. Is that right, Reverend? Really? God's promise. See? Listen, the trouble with the Pentecostal people, they too many of us, we've seen God move so much till it, it becomes common to us. Is this the next person? I'm not beside myself, but sometimes the Spirit's pulling all through the audience. So, I do not know you. You do not know me. We're strangers one to another. If the Holy Spirit can reveal to me something that that you know whether it's truth or not. You, you can witness that whether it's truth or not. You have a weakness, a nervous trouble. You've been in a hospital. And you're suffering from weakness from that operation. 
and it was cancer. And they took a lot of your organs out for the intestines. That thus saith the Lord. You believe with all your heart? Now look, you know there's something here that knows you. That that anointing is up on me now and up on you. Let me lay hands on you. Lord Jesus, I ask for healing in Jesus' name. Amen. Go not, no doubt. Go believing with all your heart. Have faith in God. You believe with all your heart? Have faith now. Start believing. How do you do, sister? You and I are strangers to one another, too. I've never seen you. You've never seen me. So this is our first time meeting. Born miles apart, years apart. The first time we've... First time we've met. Just have faith now. Just keep believing. Don't doubt. You touch him, your neck trouble will leave you, and you'll be all right. Believe with all your heart. Sing that. Wipe your eyes. Believe with all your heart. God will make you well. What did she touch? She's 30 feet from me. She touched something. She touched the high priest. The lady sitting next to you has got trouble with her eyes. She's suffering with eye trouble, too. She believed with all of her heart. She can be healed, too. Amen. Have faith and don't doubt. You suffer with heart trouble. You got leakage of the heart. You believe that God will heal you of it? Yes. You believe me as God's prophet or his servant? That name stumbles people sometimes. You believe it? Yes. Trying to get rid of a habit, too, aren't you? Yes. Get some snuff. You, did you want to give it up now? Yes, sir. I start to in the name of Jesus Christ to give the heart from this woman. Let her hold How do you do? We are strangers to one another. God knows us both. Is that right? <laughs> Just keep pulling that audience out there. I do not know you. We are strangers to one another. You're a lot younger than I am. You've been born years apart, miles apart in our first time meeting. Now, this could just go on through the night. I want you to get your face fixed with God. If it will happen to this woman, we'll all let you believe with all your heart. Let her be the judge. I was going to say, if anybody here knows her, but she's not from this city. She comes from somewhere else. That's right. But you suffer with the nervous, lung trouble, female trouble. That's right. Miss Olds, do you want to go back home and be well? Go on your road back and be well. With all your heart. You believe? Yes. Let's just worship you and sing Father God. Father God. We thank you because of our faithfulness. We pray that you will anoint the people, Lord, that they might know you to be the true and living God. We thank thee in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. What well, if I told you he was healed sitting there in his chair? Would you believe me? All right, go ahead on out. Your heart won't bother no more. Thank you, Jesus. You have to be in the name. Believe in the God of your heart. Make you well, God. If, if you can believe with all your heart, make all your own. Say, thank you, Lord Jesus, and believe with all your heart.
All right? Go eat your supper now. Your stomach trouble less. Just so you're going right now. You believe with all your heart and sight, no matter, no matter what's wrong with you, just have faith in God. Got nervous from it, but God will make you well if you believe it. Will you believe with all your heart? Yes, sir. On your own faith, thank you, Lord. You'll never be crippled with arthritis if you ask God to make you well. You believe with all your heart, everyone? God still in me? How about you keep out there without prayer cards? You believe? God is God, isn't he? What do you say to that fellow? You want to give up them cigarettes and quit smoking? Raise up your hand. It won't bother you no more. Sitting right there next to him, there's a woman on this side looking at me, Bron Caster. She believe that God will heal you, that lady? You believe with all your heart? Raise up your hand and say, I accept it. All right, there you are. What did she touch? What did they touch? They touched the master, not me. Some of the rest of you, you want to believe? This lady sitting out here with an allergy, you believe that God will make you well, sister? All right, raise up your hand, be made well. The lady sitting here looking at me here with this big purple hat on, suffering back there with uh, hemorrhoids, you believe that God will make you well, lady? Raise up on your feet if that's right. Your husband sitting right next to you there suffers with mental oppression. Raise up to your feet, brother, and accept your healing. God will make you well. Do you believe? Don't you pray for yourself, but pray for the one you got your hands on. Put your hands on one another. 